Let's do it. Mm-hmm. All righty. And it looks like I clicked the live button. I believe we're live. Looks hey, like hey, it. Hey. Yep. Perfect. Let's see here. Who is checking in? We've got some folks tuned in already. More people checking in. Get these edited here. Adjusted, not edited. Maybe. Just edit the old headphones. All right. While we wait for some people to roll in, uh, we had a couple uh, folks question me last week because I said, oh, I'll tell you how this Ezra Brooks uh, bourbon is. And then I and then drank it and got distracted didn't and didn't it. talk about it. Um, it was good, especially it was a store pick. So those are, that means that it's going to be individual per barrel or what have you. Um, ooh, that's kind of a little let down on the pop. Yeah, oh, there, oh, it, there goes. it goes. There, Ooh, much yeah, better. baby. Okay, so that's kind of a fun. That one's that bottle's gonna have to stay. That's a cool that's bottle. That's a cool bottle. Yeah, that's what I was just gonna say. It's got some stuff on it. This is Bib and Tucker. Um, another fantastic gift. Y'all are too much. And if I ever would pick bourbons for Ethan, it would definitely be based on the bottle <laughs> oh heck yeah it would be <laughs> so i appreciate cool looking bottles and this one um this one will be able to be reused because that little cork on top it'll work just perfect to stop up whatever the heck we want to stop up that's right um i just want to say tim if you are watching tonight thank you very much for the bourbon we're gonna try it here in a minute i know you said this is a good one so that's always one of those things that uh makes me just a smidgen of hesitant to give my true opinion, but I will, I will give you my opinion on whether or not this is, um, I just don't want to offend anyone because I know you said that you like this one a fair amount. It is but aged every... six years, 92 proof. I'm a lower proof kind of guy, or if it's a full proof, I got to throw a little splash of water in it take it down just a notch for me. But that's the thing. Everybody's taste buds are just a little bit different. They are. Like mine there. are just a little bit different than Ethan's because I absolutely don't like bourbon <laughs> at all. But I do like uh, chiladas. Let's look And that. I'm going to have a red beer. Gonna, oh, here, 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 here. We're going to let this breathe for a second. It smells young, and that sounds silly, but I, the more you drink, the more you try, the more you, you kind of get an idea for some of it. It smells young. Um, what does that mean? I don't know. It smells like other young bourbons that I've smelled. That's the best I can give you. Uh, we've delicious. got some check-ins already here. It says, uh, Ohio checking in, Pennsylvania checking in. Hello from Central Florida. Hey from Wisconsin. Hey, y'all. East Oklahoma was here at 7 o'clock tonight, or Goodness. 6.56, I guess. Uh, Horace, Kansas, Arkansas, Washington State. Hey, hey, hey. Mm, hey, hey, hey. Uh, we've got New Jersey. Excellent. Kelly, always enjoy having you on. Jerry Freeze at the uh, High Guys. It's another Kansas. KC. Greens from Maine. Iowa. Iceland. <laughs> halt 250R said, I'm more interested in what cat's finally drinking. <laughs> I'm more interested That's in what right. cat's finally drinking. Bud Light Chiladas, these are these are delicious. One of the things that I really enjoy, especially come summertime. Yeah, um, I am a, a really and big the fan. Can, of, the can has seen some better days. I think I dropped it, but it's okay. The um, Chiladas, in, those are my go-to breakfast beers. And if that says anything about my status as an alcohol consumer. You can't drink all day unless you start in the morning. That would be old Kirk. Kirk one, wouldn't it? Yep. Uh, From Illinois, we got Utah. Um, Kelly wants to know how Olive did at her NA test. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Uh, Olive Texas. actually did great. I don't know if Jason and Mallory are on tonight, but she that's got a good. 112 prize one. Yeah, heck yeah. She rocked it. And she was, you know, we trained her, but then um, she was handled by her family back out in California. So she did really well. That's um, always fun. Uh, yeah. Owner handling. That's awesome. Yes. Um, it says here, am I the only one able, unable to see? Is there not video coming through, guys? 
I hope there's video coming through. You got to let us know if, it, if there's anything glitchy going on. Yeah, um, we do have just a smidge of glitch on the internet, and I've been griping them out. I, For I mean, over two weeks, we've been struggling. Yeah, last week it kind of cut in a little bit, cut in and out a little bit. Um, breakfast beers. Yes, exactly. Breakfast beers. We've got California, Kansas, California, Michigan, Canada. Man, y'all are from all over the place. Prize one for Olive. Whoop, whoop. Um, and then the oldest city in America, St. Augustine, Florida. That's fantastic. That's really cool. I Fun honestly fact, didn't know if I knew that. I didn't know that. Everybody's, or we're getting some seems good now. So Okay, good. Good, good, good. good. That um, always makes me happy when we get confirmation that things are working right. And again, this week... Um, like last week for our live Yawas, now that somebody drew it to our attention, we are again not monetizing this while it's live so that you guys don't have a million advertisement interruptions that we didn't know were going on. So, uh, again, thank you for <laughs> drawing that dog to <laughs> our attention. <laughs> Y'all are funny. <laughs> Y'all are funny. I like it. Um, this is a couple times. I know people bop in and out. Uh, Bib and Tucker, uh, thank you, Tim, again. Really cool bottle. Appreciate it. Um, we've got a, yes, and Kat mentioned it right off the bat, okay? So we are going to be ad-free. Um, if you see an advertisement come up on here, mention it to me, and we'll make them go away because y'all are great. You do super chats like the first one that already came in, and we are... For you guys, going ad-free for this, because we found out it was absolutely ridiculous. I mean, what what was I it, like an ad every what, two or three yeah, minutes? Somebody said saying? they were all I the time. I want to apologize for that, first of all. I didn't realize it. I just said, yeah, YouTube, select how many ads we put in there. And they said, all the ads. All of them. All of them. So, I did want to say uh, thank you guys for the super chats. That really helps support us and the time that we put in to do this for you as well as to say thank you for that, we're ad-free. So um, the other thing that we want to say real quick, like, is thank you to the biggest supporter of everything that happens here at Standing Stone, and that is patrons. Um, we have a Patreon account set up, and that's essentially uh, another social platform. Basically, you've got Facebook, you've got Instagram. Well, this is Patreon's platform, and on Patreon, there's a message service, there's a community page so you can interact with other patrons, people that are working their dogs, brag, show off your pictures, um, chit chat with other folks that have uh, like-minded hobbies and opinions on a lot of things in life and um, also have direct access to Cat and I, which is the most powerful thing that we can offer you. We like doing this, answering questions live. We love putting together the videos showing how we train dogs and how we work through different problems. But ultimately, when it comes down to it, every dog's an individual. And when you get into situations, you're going to have questions. We are set up on Patreon to help you. Different tiers all the way from just messaging back and forth on the message service to weekly video chats. And that is the absolute most powerful thing that we have to offer. Kat and I or I, usually one or the other, we set up a Google Meets live video situation. And in that live video, we can watch your training session, give you direct feedback of, yes, that is right. Even though your dog maybe is giving you, you know, throwing you a little curveball, you're like, I don't know what to do. I'm saying, yes, keep doing exactly what you're doing or stop that. <laughs> we need to move on from here or try something different. And that helps you to move in the upward direction faster. It gives you the confidence to know that your training session is going the right way or us to give you the confidence to stop what you're doing. Um, and a lot of people, this is their first bird dog, their first time training, and they need a little bit more guidance. And like we talk about in all dog training, timing is the most important part of that. And so if you can get timing feedback from us with the proper timing and not just send a message later or let us review a video later of your training session. We're actually in the moment making corrections to your training session. Uh, that's going to make things go even smoother for your training with your, your dog. So, okay. So y'all just watched me sip that and kind of make a face. Um, I brushed my teeth. 
because Aiden was brushing his teeth. And so we did the toothbrushing thing together. Mint and um, bourbon. It's going to take a second to you need to get like, that worked out. Mm-hmm. You need to do, what, what is that? Mouthwash with <laughs> bourbon. Yeah, yeah, here we go. This is going to burn, but. <laughs> um, while Ethan's, oh, you just, ah, it's, it's. <coughs> That's you a lot. Spit it on me. I'm sorry, babe. I think the whole palate is cleansed. <laughs> um, the last thing that I want to touch on with that specifically is when you watch our videos, those training sessions are live. They are a 100% straight through training session showing you what we did, what our plan was, what happened right, and what seems to be the common trending thing of what Ethan did wrong in that specific video. I don't know if I'm losing my touch or what, but there's been yeah. a handful of Have you of guys those. watched the most recent um, oh, video with Thunder and his mm-hmm. woe training? First of all, the dude was driving me nuts, okay? so And it's in the video, so you get to see it. Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, go on, check that out, take a look. Throw a comment in below. Ha ha, I see exactly what you're talking about, Ethan. Um, and then, uh, you know, from there, learn from my mistakes. <laughs> the other side of it is when you, uh, when you watch yourself back. So if you video your own training sessions and watch yourself back, you get to see all of the things that you, in fact, are doing wrong. But where I was going with that comment is all of the sessions are live. The thing that is not... Um, probably going to happen in a majority of them is big mistakes, okay? Little things here and there, but for the most part, we see something, we make the proper correction, and our timing is mostly right. And when those things happen, everything clicks into place. So it makes our dogs look probably better than they are. Um, Because we've been doing this a long time, guys. A long time, yeah. Speaking of a long time. Today. Yesterday, but you're close enough, honey. Um. As of June 1st, that's our business anniversary date, and we have been in business for Standing ourselves Kennels, established officially 2012. since June 1st, 2012. So mm-hmm. nine years. Um, we have been in dogs longer than that, but for doing it for ourselves, nine years. So we've it's been, been doing a this wild a while, ride, folks. But we've been doing this a while. So we even make adjustments and changes in training sessions so subtly that sometimes we don't even recognize that we're doing it. And, and, most and of the people time, will call us on it and be like, hey, I recognize that you did, did this. Why did you do that? And I'm like, oh, I didn't even know I did it. But thanks for pointing it out because that's important. Well, the other side of it is, I mean, we see problems in the training sessions as they're coming up and then make adjustments. And a lot of it, completely new ideas. Well, I've never seen this before. So let's try that. Oh, look at that. It worked for this dog. So all said and done, Patreon is where we can offer our experience to be able to help you move in the upward trend of your training goals, all right? I also wanted to mention, because we're getting really excited, we have hit 90,000 subscribers, guys, on YouTube, which, which is, is absolutely big. fantastic. That's huge. It's huge. It's like bigger than what we were when we hit 80,000. Funny how that works. The numbers just keep going up. It, we're, we're older, Mommy. <laughs> yes. Uh, Aiden is very excited to play with our newest member, Cade. And I keep telling them that Cade has to be a little bit Way older before now. he plays with you, Aiden, because he's just a little baby right now. Every morning he wakes up and he asks if baby Cade is older now. Yeah. Well, yes, baby technically he is older yeah. now, but still not quite old enough to actually play with you, honey. He'll get there, though. But that means we have less than 10,000 subscribers to go to hit that big 100,000 subscriber mark, get that really big, awesome silver play button, and probably get demonetized. Yeah, probably. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good thing. We found out that that's kind of like That's a their, thing that YouTube's their, been doing. Well, it's their turning point. It's like, oh, you hit 100,000. Let's pay more attention to you now. Um, I wanted to pull – I was going to see if I could pull this up. While we're, what were you trying to pull up? Oh, the statistics, because it's somewhere, it's a ridiculous number, all right? So, you've got, um, 
I think it's like 70 some percent of the people that watch our videos are not currently active subscribers. Yeah, it'll show you right here in the analytics. What's that I was pulling up here? Analytics, subscription. We can get 82.4% oh are not word. subscribed. That's horrible, folks. Only 17% of you guys that watch our videos, which probably are Yawa people, are most of the time subscribers. But, uh, yeah, only 17.6% of people that watch our videos subscribe to our videos. So, if we can up that number, we could probably hit that 100,000K mark a little bit faster, um, which is something that we wanted to ask you guys to help out with. Um, if you guys watch one of our videos and go, holy cow, this information was really, really good, or I never thought of that before. I bet there's a lot of people out there that haven't thought of that before. If you would be so kind as to share that video somewhere, whether it's on Facebook, Instagram, a story post, I don't know, tweety, tweeting it. I don't tweet, so I don't really know how that works. Um, but anything like that would be super helpful because it just gets our videos out there in front of more people, more eyes. And ultimately what we're passionate about is helping more people train their dogs, learn that there's resources out there to help them. And this would allow that information to spread a little bit more. Yeah. So if you're on any Facebook group or, um, there's a lot of really good dog training related Facebook groups, share a video that you found helpful to you or even, um, the, the wild world of, uh, what is that called? Reddit. Reddit. Yeah, Reddit. If you find a Reddit thread that makes you thready, um, share a video link in there. We'd appreciate anything you guys want to throw out there. Really helps. Now, on to what we titled this Yawa, which is, do you have one other thing? I just wanted to mentioned because we did have a super chat and we did Spurs, not forget about you yes spurs and fun no spurs and fun sorry spurs and fur outdoors we will get to your super chat and we have decided that we want to have a little more theme to structure. our structure, structure. there we go. Structure mm -hmm. to our yawas so we want to go over some pertinent information like we just have um, share what Ethan's drinking because everyone wants to know apparently. And then also get into a topic that we will pre-announce like we did. Just leaving time for Ethan to have a brutally honest comment at the end and then roll right into our super chat question. So we will not forget about you and we will definitely get to your question. It yeah, just all the is questions going will be answered be in a few minutes in order of the super chats that come through. So, um, the topic for today, as we come into the summer, there's going to be a lot of training and there's going to be a lot of what, folks? Heat, okay? Heat is our biggest enemy for the dogs, especially this time of year. And we want to talk about, A, um, signs of heat exhaustion, heat stroke, those kind of horrible things that can happen to your dog some things that you can do to prevent them. Also some kind of misconceptions that people probably include or incorporate or try and do or think they're in the good when in fact they are not. And then uh, last but not least, I have a wonderfully, brutally honest Ethan moment for y'all um, to finish that out. So to start with, I found a list just to be inclusive and not forget... Um, any of the things myself, but signs of a heat stroke, okay? Um, excessive panting, all right? So if your dog is excessive panting, what we mean, like all dogs pant when they run around, they're going to get hot. Don't instantly jump to, oh, my dog's panting, right? They're overheating. They're having a heat stroke. That's not, not the happen. case. The reason, why, why do dogs pant? Kat, you know the answer to this. Because they're not able to sweat. Boom, baby. Yeah. So they expire, perspire through their pads in their mouths. And then um, I was they just. Do, they do kind of they baby get some sweat moisture through on their, their pads. The pads of their feet. Yeah, but it's not real sweating. No, they don't. But dogs don't have evaporative cooling systems like we do. They mm -hmm. don't sweat. And then the cool air can't hit them to help cool their bodies. So they're doing that through their mouths. But you think about that. Their mouths are a very 
small surface area, small part, um, their tongues of their bodies. So that evaporative cooling process is much less efficient just being centralized on their mouth. So what is Yawa? Yawa is you ask, we answer. That's what that kind of stemmed from. And then also how do the Yawa questions work? Um, Anybody can ask questions throughout this that are live. We do give priority to the questions that come through as super chats. So now uh, the next here says signs. So I wanted to just mention, so the excessive panting. So if your dog basically cannot keep their tongue in their head, uh, they're breathing only through their mouth. You'll see their throat from what you Way normally wo- opened up. It's like you could throw a, a ping pong ball down there, not touch anything. That's the kind of full open throat. You are approaching way too hot. Time okay. to take a break. Cool off your dog. You, you've done past the time to take a break zone, so you definitely don't need to, ah, oh, we'll just hunt you back to the truck. Yeah, just Mm-mm. just one more rep. Just one more yeah. whatever. No, you're no, done. You're done. Um, so that I just wanted to mention what we're meaning when it's excessive panting. Yes, so that's a good one. Um, Increased heart rate. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I personally don't uh, see visually increased heart rate in my dogs, okay? But um, does anybody off the top of their head know what uh, the average heart rate of a dog should be? I don't even know if I do. I know their temperature. That's a good one. We're coming to that. I'll give you some time on that. Google okay? it. Quick, yeah, somebody sure. Google it. Somebody Google it. Um, excessive heart rate is listed here as a sign. Um, the next is going to be confusion or disorientation. Now, this one you will probably see visually pretty easy, okay? Um, the dog's going to be wobbly. They're going to be looking around. They're going to be dazed and confused because they're to a point of their brain is overheating, basically. And it's one that's scary. A uh, wobbly dog. I saw this. Um, I'm going to tell a story about this. Remind me once we get through this list. So with a, I saw this this fall with a dog. Okay. And I will walk you through step by step what we ended up doing. And had it not been quite as dire a situation, I'd have pitched my phone to somebody and said, Hey, video this while we're going. But, um, it was, it was pretty sketchy. So 125 beats per minute. So is, is that a guess or is that you, did you I look it up? That, that was. Because I was going to say 90. I don't even know. 60 to 120. That's mm-hmm. average. Cool. Don't really know. I don't even know how you would check that real quick just to make sure. I mean, I know how to check a heartbeat, but same time, I don't view that as a, a sign that you should be looking for. Um, the next is going to be vomiting or diarrhea. Okay. So these again are excessive things. Uh, usually. When dogs get hot, people allow them to tank on water, which is something we'll be talking about in a second. But then that causes vomiting because they fill up with too much. But They overdrank. Yeah. If they just start puking before they've had the water, that's a bad deal. The other side of it is diarrhea can happen. A little bit of stress stool from We've working and exercising um, can, can happen. So, you know, but uncontrollable, constant diarrhea would definitely be something that you'd want to be looking for. Okay, so the next here, we would say bright red gums, which you're going to see those things when the dog's mouth's open. Um, a body temperature of higher than 104, 104 degrees. Anybody, anybody, bonus points for you can throw in the comment of what should your dog's body temperature be. Now, obviously, they're going to be a little bit elevated if they're hunting or active or working, but... In excess of 104, you're getting way baby hot. Yep. So I just looked also up for the average heart rate because I wanted to have something to go off of. Mm -hmm. Um, So small dogs and puppies, 120 to 160 beats per minute. Dogs over 30 pounds have heart rates of 60 to 120. So most of our hunting dogs and, you know, that aren't puppies should be that 60 to 120 rate. This is good. It was better after the mouthwash rinse. Mm, yes, it's good. It's um different than what I normally drink because it's definitely not. Uh, I would I would yes, it's definitely not a primarily weeded bourbon, but it's tasty. Okay, so the last thing they have listed on here: collapse, seizure, or coma. If you guys get to that point, I mean, it's a bad deal. 
Now, I have seen several of these things, okay? I didn't know if your list was done. Yeah, that's it. That's the last on this list that I found that seemed fairly inclusive, okay? So. And nobody's bopped in with temperature on the dog. So average temperature for our short hairs is about 100 to 101.5 degrees. Yes. We personally, if we've got a dog that's just chilling in the house and I take their temperature because I'm like, eh, they seem that like they're just acting a little bit off. And if they're at 102.5, even though that's not truly considered a fever or elevated temperature yet for yeah, We've dealt a with dog, that firsthand. We've been at a vet clinic and they measure 102.5, 102.6, whatever. And they're like, ah, that's, that's normal. That's normal. Nah. For our dogs, that is not normal. And that's an indication of infection. Mm -hmm. First indication of infection. So we um, monitor our dog's personal temperatures very closely. Not a bad idea for you guys to have a baseline, to know what to expect, especially from a breeding standpoint, because we also look for a temperature drop during um, pre-whelping. And then again, letting you know if you are looking at an infection or something, you've got your baseline. So 100 to 101.5. Now... Of all of these things on the list, I have experienced most of them, okay? Now, so that being said, no matter how much time, effort, energy, attempts you put in to take care of your dogs, if you hunt them and work them or are around other people with dogs, you're going to see these things. The excessive panting happens because it can come up really quick. Even this time of year, it's pretty sketchy. I mean, you can go out and go, oh, yeah, it feels all right. And then all of a sudden, the dogs are way hotter because they are lower, And there may not be as much wind or the sun pops out and that sun adds a lot of intensity to whatever the day is. And down in the thicker grass, it holds heat more um, as well as humidity can play a huge role. And it just can turn on hot just like that. And the dogs go, (gasps) now I'm hot. Yeah. And I mean, it happens to us too, but still they're essentially wearing a fur coat and working way harder than we are. We got this question. And don't sweat like we talked about. And don't sweat. So we got this question here even recently that was, and get it fairly regular. How hot is too hot? There's too many variables. uh, And what you need to be doing is reading the signs of your dog and saying, do I see this, 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 this? No, the dog is still okay. Um, As well as we're going to get into here some preventative things that you can be doing. Now, the next is going to be that confusion or disorientation and then also collapse and seizure. Um, Confusion, disorientation is usually headed in the direction of collapse and potentially seizures. We saw this firsthand. This was with grandpa. You remember that? When we were at a rendezvous. Yes. So he was walking around with us on leash and he started pulling on leash and got himself hotter than he could. Well, I didn't realize, okay, he was hot and we were in one of the tents and it was hot and the heat was building and he's old, which also doesn't help him. And it was old at the time of this because it was only maybe three, four years ago. It was right before Aiden. Okay. So probably three years ago. Um, and he got wobbly and kind of disoriented. Hey buddy, what's going on? And then he fell down and had a mini seizure. I mean, it was... It only lasted for a few seconds, and he got up, and he was like, whoa. And it was because he'd gotten too hot and was pulling. I I mean, I don't know. It was a weird thing. Never has he ever had a seizure before Mm -hmm. or since then, and And that's the only thing that we can. He got too hot for him. Yep. So uh, definitely a scary deal. The next here is going to be um, saying the... Another situation was hunting this last fall. Okay, so this last fall, we had some abnormally warm temperatures, and this was later in the season. It was kind of a weird deal when we were in South Dakota. Opening weekend was nice. It was like 60 degrees and 55, 60 degrees, which can be on the edge of warm, uh, depending on sun and wind and things like that. But then the next, like rolling right into that next week, so three to five days later, we had a blizzard. And the snow was on the ground for almost five to seven days. And then by the last w- week that I was up there, which is like mid-November, it was highs in the 70s, upper 70s. And we finished out a hunt. And there was a, it was like one of those deals that 
I could tell it was warming up and we kind of birds started popping here and moving into there. And then <laughs> that was weird. Um, popping and moved into this next zone. Everybody's fired up like, Oh, let's go. Well, at this point, this specific group has quite a few dogs. So I had maybe one dog on the ground, but then I was helping direct people as well as watching other dogs. And I see this dog that was not mine on the ground and it's hunting. And I'm like, girl, you look hot. Like just, you don't seem like you're doing great. And I was trying to get her and then there'd go a bird and she'd take off after it. Well, she's not running, you know, with us here. Then she chases this bird because the handler was over here. So they're not seeing exactly what's going on. And there she runs out three or 400 yards and then ends up circling back. It was a, a thinner, like food plot, grass strip area, and then bare open fields either side. So we're out wide and she's running this open field and then loops around. And about the time I'm trying to catch her to stop her because she's hot and you, I'm starting to see these things. Her tongue's hanging out of her head. She's panting excessively. She's, it's warm outside. Well, then phew, there goes another bird and she takes off. And about the third time we get to the end of this and I'm trying to get this dog. Well, then more birds go. And it was just chaotic um, South Dakota adventure of birds everywhere. And we get to the end and I see her and I'm trying to get water and I'm trying to get her cooled down, whatever is going on. And I see her, she just collapses right there. She just couldn't do it anymore and pushed herself to the extreme because she, I couldn't get to her. I couldn't get to them. It was just a chaotic type situation. So instantly everybody's like, well, let's, you know, I've got water. They start pulling water out of the cooler. No, bad. Okay. And the reason for that is it's too big of a shock. They're essentially pouring ice water onto a dog that's overheated. So we're going to go from way too hot to too cold, essentially way too fast. So we stop that. I have lukewarm water essentially that's in the tank in the back of my truck. So it was filled up in the morning, but it's been bouncing around. So it's like 70 degrees. I got bowls of that and start wetting her down and then got her up. They're like, oh, we'll just let her cool off here. No, she's laying flat on the ground in the grass where there's no wind. She can't cool off. So I soaked her whole body down with this warm-esque water, then got her up and started walking her around. And we walked and we walked and we walked and she's wobbly and I would stop and she's wobbly and like, can you stand on your own? And she'd start to just like fall down. No, you still can't continue. Now, the places that we had to get wet, I wetted her whole body down because at this point it was like every inch of her is going to get a little of that breeze across it and we can help the body temperature the come down. Cooling, yes. for sure. But um, big things are ears have a ton of blood vessels on. So that's where we added just a little bit. We started moving into a little bit cooler water, but definitely not straight ice water as well as definitely not just ice. Um, I've seen people throw ice in dog boxes or throw ice in, you know, like, oh, we'll, we'll get them cooled down really fast. And that's a horrible idea. So all we did with her. So if you're seeing these things, I put water on her. Um, it's better on them than in them. This was a, a old bird dog buddy told me he was, he was talking about hot dogs and something else. And he said, it's always better on them than in them. Okay. Got it. Okay. okay, Timmy. Okay, Tim. Yeah. So, um, but water all over her and I kept her up and moving just slow especially walking. water in those places that have a lot of blood Ears, vessels vascular the areas head, the armpits, armpits the groin the belly yep get all of it wet yep. and then walk her around and help cool her up. and she's fine and did well but I would bet you anything because this is how this stuff works is she reached the brink. I mean, if that wasn't heat exhaustion or almost heat stroke, I don't know what would be. I've never seen anything as bad as that. Um, and she was bad. Uh, it's going to come back faster next yes. time. Typically, She's not going to have the same heat tolerance. Yep. Typically dogs that have a bad experience with heat don't tolerate the heat as well in the future. Um, no. Somebody else mentioned, do you find that the dog or GSP looking for shade as a clue. Absolutely. Looking for shade, looking for water. If you're hunting or training near a pond and the dog gets in the water. You just go lay in a puddle. Those are for sure indications that the dog is recognizing that they're getting too hot and they're trying to cool themselves off. Which so is saying something. That's because saying something because a lot of times the dogs are so pumped up about what they're doing and we have to be their advocates and say, no, 
you need to take a break. You need to cool off. You need to take a time out. And they don't want to because they're right. loving it. Crazy Sammy. We used to, oh, before we, did we knew anything, wrong. we yeah. did everything Just wrong. run her till she tipped over, hose her off, and start again. She loved to play fetch, and we had all the bad things. We were using a chuck it with tennis balls yeah. for retrieving, and we would chuck it in the backyard as far as we could, as long as we could in the evenings to try and wear Crazy Sammy out. And she yep. would retrieve and retrieve and retrieve and then come back and lay down by the water hose for us to hose her down, cool her off, do it again. Yep. And, you know, we, like we said, we made mistakes and we didn't necessarily know what she was trying to show us and what we were seeing. Um, so we are trying to share these experiences with you so that you don't make the same mistakes. Um, because also if a dog is so far gone heat wise and they go and get in a pond, that's not necessarily a good thing either because, um, being in the water especially if that water is warm, is just like being in a sauna. They need to be wet, and then they need to get out of that water so that the evaporative cooling can work. Otherwise, it's just like being wrapped in a wet blanket. Um, that's a great question that came through here, and it's on the same topic of the water. It's electrolytes, and we'll touch base on that here. We'll, that'll be a really good one that we want to touch base on. But um, So remind me. If, you don't, if, you, if we forget, just remind me. I electrolytes also, are important. I also saw a comment here that I wanted to important to talk about. Hit on. I've seen working dogs at 105.5 and they were acting completely normal. So yeah. I, the other thing that I want to mention is like we said, our dogs temperatures, we know their baseline. Obviously there's going to be differences between breeds, size of dogs, things like that, as well as acclimation makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. You can get a dog first time in the spring first warm days, that they can't handle 70 degrees. No, especially you bring some northern dogs down to the south, and we qualify as central dogs going to the south. When I go down and hunt in Texas, there's times where it'll be, we're coming out of winter, right? Cold, it's Our January. Our dogs are used to 30 Cold. degrees. Yep, and then I go down and it bobs up to 68. They're sucking wind. By day three, they're usually better. A little more acclimated, yeah. but it takes time. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons that we keep the temperature of our kennel a little more moderate. Um, in the summer, we don't keep it at 68, 69 degrees air conditioning because when they have to go outside and work hard, they can't have that giant shock it's to their system. Yep. So we try and keep it closer to 75 degrees in the kennel mm -hmm. during the summer. Same thing in reverse. Yeah. Same thing in reverse in the winter. You know, we're not keeping it a roasty, toasty 75 degrees in the winter. We're keeping it at 65 degrees in the winter so that it's not as big of a shock to those dogs. Somebody accused me of being a tightwad saying, oh, you don't like to climate control this facility for your dogs. I'm like, No, we can do anything. Uh, we need it to the dogs to be acclimated. It's not like, and there's a fine line with that because... Dogs can take drastically colder and warmer temperatures than, than what is optimal, but what is optimal is important. So we need, we need them to be acclimated as close to the temperatures without being too far that direction. So if we're keeping it too cold, then they're having to work too hard to maintain their own body temperature. And then it's like a vicious cycle of not ever being able to feed them enough because shivering takes a lot of energy up. Staying warm takes a lot of energy. So it is, uh, you know, that 65 range is, uh, is really good in the winter, dead of winter. And then that 75 to 78, like right now we're 75 because we're coming into the warmer days when our average temperatures outside are starting first thing in the morning at 75 degrees, which we're not far from 78 and, you know, under 80 is ideal. But the closest to that that we can get, the easier it's going to be on them going back and forth. So, Good information. Good, good information. Okay. The next thing is um, we've talked about some of the signs as well as kind of how to take care of these dogs that are showing these things. The, n the next thing is going to be some of those misconceptions, okay? Um, Kat mentioned it or kind of touched on it is the water, okay? People are like, oh, yeah, summertime. I'm going to train my dogs in the water. Okay, what temperature is that water is the question we have to ask. Dead of summer, that water can get pretty warm. Especially if it's a shallow pond, even though it's wet, doesn't mean it's cool and Heck, not here. going to be 
evaporative cooling if they are staying in the water constantly and they can overheat in the water just like they can overheat on land. All right, so there's a Cheney Lake. Ooh, the water temp has come down with the, uh, a lot of rain recently. That's old, maybe. But also, the lake is going to be a little bit different story than a pond that you're training in. And because there's so much more volume and it's deeper water. Um, but like our pond in the back here, it's maybe five feet at the deepest point. Yeah. And it's, it's going to heat up, heat up really a fast. lot more. It's going to feel like bath water. And that's not going to be very um, cooling to a dog. Well, it's the equivalent of 75 degrees. So if you're working them hard in that and it's hotter outside, 75 degrees in the water, they're never getting out of that 75 plus degree weather. And that's hot, folks. I yeah. mean, that's that's hot. So um, it's not a magic answer just to play in the water. Now, if you have running water, now, I'm not recommending you go to the Mississippi, you know, down south and throw your dog out there. But if you have, there are places where a river or a stream is swimmable or something to that effect. And you have a strong swimmer. It's a, sh- it's a calmer area in that. But that moving water is going to be naturally cooler because uh, it's not sitting there to stay warm. So that would be an option. Just depends on what kind of body of water it is, as well as the size of the body of water. A bigger lake is going to, you know, it's never going to warm up to the extent. I think, what were we? Um, we were up in the north. Oh, the Great my Lakes. goodness. Yeah, when we were in Michigan visiting. It was hot outside. Our friends in the UP. It was, it was in when May or June. Memorial Day. It was when we were there that Katie just posted that. Like, we miss you guys. Yeah, so it was, it was around Memorial. this time. Day, which yep. they they just had a freaking snow. snow. They just had Did snow. Did they have so snow? Yes. It was like 30 degrees and snowing outside, which is retarded, okay? Uh, I don't mean to use that word, but it's bad. It's dumb. Why? why it's, we it's don't live June. there for a reason. It's June, folks. Why is it snowing? So anyhow, we're up there, and it was a nice day. I don't know. It was Warm nice. out, yeah. 70, 75. Like, let's, let's fire up the, the sauna. Sa- 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 sauna. 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 That's sauna. how they say it. So Sauna something sauna sauna S- sauna so we were sauna. sitting there in the something sauna like that sauna like, oh let's go jump in the lake y'all wait I that said was that, wrong. that was a complete shock to the system like we oh talked about lake, not doing to your dogs we did it, it like to ourselves degrees? yeah and i got a bloody we, nose we complain about it and rich always gives us a hard time oh wasn't that cold it was cold. It was cold. It was and, like, whoo. And also, they're more acclimated to those temperatures where we're like, that's really cold. It's been like 80 degrees out. No. My balls just turned into cranberries. <laughs> so, anyhow, um, the lake is not your saving grace. That is what we're getting at. Running water, pay attention to the temperature of that water. Um, the next thing is going to be that's key. And we talked about this, but acclimation. So, start prepping your dogs. By running them, incorporate cooler times of the day to run them. Somebody, I was talking to a gentleman today from Arizona. He's like, yeah, I train pretty much in the middle of the night. I'm like, well, I don't know how you do that from a light standpoint, but. Potentially a conditioning standpoint, roading them or something like that. But again, there's places um, that don't get below 70 or 80 degrees, even at night. I mean, we've been there at certain times of the year. Um, and so you do, you start acclimating earlier in the spring to work your dogs into it and condition them. Um, but you do also utilize the coolest parts of the day to try and get your training done, um, and, and plan to keep your dogs cool and training sessions short. Okay. So we have some of the signs. We have some of the ways to kind of work through if you see your dog acting any of these things, uh, some of the misconceptions, and um, I think we're, do you have anything else to add with that? Or are we ready for a brutally honest version of me? I think so. I think we really hit on everything. If you guys have any other questions, definitely let us know about keeping your dogs cool and protecting them from overheating during summer and spring training. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, I think we're ready. I, th- I think everybody here, hold on. Yep, ready for it. Brutally honest comment. Here we come. Okay, so here it it is, right? 
How many of you have considered cracking the windows as a way to provide proper temperatures inside your vehicle for your dog? It's ridiculous, folks. Absolutely ridiculous, okay? So we hear this on a regular basis. We see this. I've seen windows cracked, all the things, okay? Um, Why not just run the vehicle with the air conditioning running in the vehicle for the dogs. Electrolyzed reminder. Yeah. Woo, woo, yeah thank we'll you circle all. back. Yeah, we're circling. Um, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. First of all, we're talking about literally pennies to dollars maximum. If gas goes up, maybe a little bit more. Maybe than a little that. bit more. But you guys are being ridiculously cheap and not uh, um, considerate of the animals. I mean, would you leave a person in the vehicle with just the windows cracked a little bit? We've no. done it. I did Ethan it. Ethan and I did it. We did it. I think there's a video. There is a video. Have and to. we sweated our balls off, okay? And it was this time, what was it outside, 70 degrees? It wasn't a super hot day. No, it was one of those very first warmer days, sunny days in the spring. And we just barely cracked the window just like they do for, or like we see they do with I felt panicky. Dogs. I felt hot. I knew I could open the door, and it still was horrible, all right? It got to be 125, 130 degrees inside the car. how hot it was. It was I don't close. think it got that hot. It was hot. It was hot. It was over 120 degrees, I guarantee it. It's been a couple I was there. years it was since we did that. But. Don't be cheap. Don't be tight wads. Take care of your animals. If you have to go someplace with them, leave the vehicle running. Lock we- the doors. Turn the AC on. We do it all the time. Puppy Shock comes with us almost any time we go to town, and we've had quite a few town runs with doctors' appointments and stuff. You're like, oh, my goodness, you're leaving your stuff. vehicle running? Yes, I have a dog in there, and they're going to stay cool in the air conditioning, safe, okay? And one That's thing it. that I do want to mention, because I didn't know this. If your vehicle does not have a key, if you have a push-button start thing, that sucker will shut off on you unless you turn that feature off. If, it, yeah, if it's like within 15 minutes. <laughs> it got over minutes. 120. I remember the video. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was hot. It was hot. I was um, sweating just thinking about it. Yeah. Um, but make sure that you turn that feature off. There's a way to turn that feature off, mm-hmm. but you have to do it every time you turn the vehicle on. It's so annoying. It is annoying, and it's something that I, as a dog owner, that we travel with our dogs in the vehicle, summertime, wintertime, all the time, and leave the vehicle running for them a lot, that I am always conscious of making sure that I've turned that feature off so that the car doesn't shut off on me because the only reason I knew about it was Ethan ran into Orschlands while I was sitting in the vehicle with it running, running, waiting for him, and I was in there with... Aiden, it was when we got a newer vehicle when he was just born, and we were sitting there, and I was just hanging out waiting, and Orschland's trip took a little bit longer, and the car just shut off, and I was like, what just happened? Why did that just happen? That would have been terrible if it had happened for the first time when yeah. I wasn't I expecting that to happen. the vehicle was just left running with it locked. Yeah. Yeah, and Bad so deal. then we were like, well, there's got to be a way to shut this feature off, and we researched it, and we figured it out, and there is in, a, in the settings a way to do that. Um, but if you've got a newer vehicle, definitely make sure that that feature is turned off so that your vehicle will stay running for longer than 15 or 20 or 30 minutes or whatever it is. But Take um, care of your dogs. We see it all the time. I mean, even at hunt tests and trials and everything, it's – Dogs are staked out, you know, oh, yeah, look at that. They've got uh, a bucket of water next to them. It's not enough, folks. They're sitting there baking, okay? Um, Acclimation is important. We can't just have an ice box to go out into the heat, but you still take care of them, all right? If you feel hot, they feel hot or hotter, okay? There it is. Brutally honest, no sugar coating. Don't do that. All right, let's get to some questions. Electrolytes. Electrolytes. Okay, fine. Electrolytes. We'll talk <laughs> about it. circling back. We're, we're circled. Electrolytes. Okay. Um, you ask, do the dogs need electrolytes? The answer to that is pretty much no, um, especially not the way that we do. And the reason for that is directly related to the fact that we just mentioned they don't sweat. Okay. Um, when we sweat, the reason we need electrolytes is because we lose a lot of those salts, which is why your sweat is salty, and you need to replenish those electrolytes because of all the sweating. 
Dogs don't sweat. They don't need electrolytes the same way that we do. A little bit isn't going to hurt them here or there, but somebody said, have two sets of keys so your dog doesn't lock you out. Put your dog in a crate, okay? <laughs> there, more brutally honestness coming out here. Put your dog in a crate. Um, the next thing here is just, <laughs> I mean, come on. Um, the dogs don't need electrolytes the same way. There are, it's like blue light was not one for a while. I don't know if they're still around. Blue something else, blue canine, blue something. The electrolyte drinks are not necessary for dogs. Straight water works, not ice water, and help uh, let them cool off first before you give them access to the water so that they don't take. They can drink what they need, not tank. Or give them a little bit and then cut them off. Say, here, you got a little lick, 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 lick. We use water bottles with a squirt bottle top squirt, and squirt, squirt it across their mouth, not mm-hmm. down their throat, um, so they don't aspirate it, but also then they're getting their tongue and gums wet, lapping a little bit, um, but we can control their intake as well. And then, like we mentioned before, and I'll say it again, better on them than in them. Yes, so. better on them than in them. Okay. Um, now, we have some super chats. We do have some super chats. Roll so. up and get started on those. Okay. Super chat number one from Spurs and Fur Outdoors. I wanted to do it again. I wanted to say Spurs and Fun. I don't know. It just sounds more fun. Well, you just imposed those two. You could have said Spurs, Spurs are, are fun. fun. Ooh, yeah. Spurs are fun. If well, you only had today. five pigeons to use for training that aren't homing pigeons, how would you use them? I know it's not the ideal situation. So that's a good question, and we've actually talked about this a little bit of what is your go-to training bird, and Ethan and I had a giant debate about it, and then I won because I was right. She did. Um, Pigeons are definitely our go-to training bird if we only could have one training bird. I'm not Um, wrong often, but when I am, it's usually in a conversation with my wife. That's right. Um, But I would use one of those pigeons for a bird introduction. And gunfire introduction, if at all possible, to incorporate the two. Um, If you aren't able to do both a bird and gunfire introduction in the same session because your puppy is a little hesitant about your bird intro, um, then you're going to need another bird once they gain some more confidence to do um, the the bird and gun intro together. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And then we'd be down to three pigeons, four, if we can um, utilize it together. Uh, I really want to also do a positive pigeon drill I'm and gonna say, a pigeon course. Take those five pigeons and rub them together and turn them into more pigeons. <laughs> Maybe let them do a little dance, <laughs> make a little love, and make more babies. Um, but That's good, babe. <laughs> I like it. Hey. Get down tonight. But I really like our positive pigeon drill, but also a minimum of three birds to be able to do a pigeon course would be ideal in launchers. Yeah, two to three. Do you have launchers? That's a good question. Because if you don't have launchers, I would use the rest for a positive pigeon drill, and then you could potentially do you have do electronic birds. bird launchers? Yeah. Take it. If you don't. I would also see if you can... Borrow some. Res- resource some more birds, <laughs> some more pigeons if you could. Get some more pigeons, um, y'all. Because I think when I did the positive pigeon drill with tricks, I think I used five or maybe six pigeons. I think six because we said our pigeons are about five bucks a piece and it was a $30 drill. So you could probably get by with, you know, five or six pigeons for your positive pigeon drill and then another five or six for a pigeon course. And then depending on how your puppy does and if your timing is good and your electronic launchers work right, then you should be able to move on to the next step of training. You need to get more birds. Birds make a bird dog. Yeah. So, but that would be where I'd start. Perfect. Great question. I think it's a really, I mean, honestly, it's a really good question. It's a, it's a thing that the average person is working with. It's a, Um, struggling to find birds, struggling to find birds, having a few, trying to figure out the best way to utilize what you have, you know, get the most bang for your buck, if you will. And, uh, we have available on occasion, 
Um, we're about out for the year because I have to maintain enough birds here for training. But um, we had some available on our standing stone supply. Yes, feral pigeons and homers if you want to start your own. That's the best way to do it is start, start your own re- renewable resource there. Um, yeah, especially for when your puppy's learning to point and doing the positive pigeon drill. If you have those renewable birds that come back, you can reuse them for those situations. You can't reuse them for, you know, your bird intros. I mean, start now, get some homers, uh, which you're kind of on the tail end of being able to do that. But get some if you can. Let them do their thing. By next spring, you're going to be rocking and rolling. They're going to be making more than you can deal with. And then you've got extra. You can sell them to your buddies. It's a a win, 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 win. And on top of that, they're cool. And they poop all over the place. So, there's that. Gotta love pigeons. I, if you're I do. Even, I, like I know. Pigeons. I know. So, I hopefully mug, that was a good that. start I to like answering pigeons. your question. I need. I so, need to make that a coffee mug that just says "I heart pigeons." I'm sure that's already it. there. Next super chat from Michael Gamaro. Okay, he's a patron. He's a patron. What are you doing? Throwing super chats up on here. <laughs> Thank you, by the way. Uh, Goose is back. Heck yeah. No accidents in the house yet outside the kennel. Hell yeah. Um, r- outside kennel, remember, laugh out loud. Today's walk had lots of distractions. Is it okay to go back to over the muzzle on lead? So this is a really good question, and people ask us this question, or not this specific question, but ask us about healing all the time. And they say, you know, I get to watch his training videos today too. So I'll tell you, I'll fill you in on that. Okay. So a lot of times people say, you know, I can only take my dog for a walk with the easy lead up over their muzzle. It's the only way that I can get them to heel next to me without pulling with distractions and things like that. As soon as I try and transition to the slip lead or to the clip lead, they're pulling again, um, especially if there's distractions and The biggest thing that we can say about that is going for a walk is not the ideal time to be working on healing. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but you need to put the time in before you just try and go for a half mile or mile walk or how, you know, around the block, whatever your walk is, you need to do some healing drills before you get there because... Your dog needs to have a more solid understanding of the behavior. You need to be able to make corrections. You need to hold them accountable. And when you're just going for a walk, trying to make forward progress, what happens is you get more and more and more and more lax. And you're like, that's close enough. That's a good enough heel. And then eventually your dog's a whole dog length ahead of you, pulling you down the road again. And if you can do some of our healing drills in a more controlled environment to make good progress, build on success, and make timely corrections, and hold yourself and your dog accountable, that's when you're going to see the progress being made. So the 10-yard healing drill is probably one of my favorite healing drills that we have out there, where you're just walking 10 yards with your dog, holding them accountable, turning around and walking back the same 10 yards. So you're not making any forward progress, but you are making progress in their healing position. And if you do that drill on a sidewalk or on a driveway that has those lines. Oh, we got another super chat, so I'm going to have to. Have another. Sitting here, I thought we were done, and then here here we go, guys. Um, But that is going to allow you to help keep yourself honest saying, oh, he was ahead of me at this line because he crossed that line before I did. And that's a really good visual for you to say, yeah, that was um, him not standing or not staying in a healing position. So working through some of those drills and then, um, and you can do those drills with the easy lead over the muzzle. Then you can do those same drills with them slip lead, same drills, collar conditioning transition, same drills when you're clip lead, and even the same drills once they're collar conditioned to just hold them accountable, get your reps in. And then, of course, you can go for rock, for walks once you actually have made some progress. But I honestly feel that if your dog has made progress up to a certain point and then you're going to go for a walk and then throw the easy lead back up over the muzzle. 
it's doable. You can do that. We have done it in certain situations where there's just a ton of distractions. Um, one of the places, two of the places that come to my mind are Game Fair and Pheasant Fest. I, I mean, Ethan and I go to those shows. There are a ton of people, a ton of dogs, a ton of distractions. And typically when we're walking in and out of those shows, our hands are full. I mean, we're carrying dog beds and dog treats and water and supplies and things like that, um, equipment in and out of the shows. So we don't have hands to handle transmitters and make corrections and things like that. So easy lead up over the muzzle. But if I'm actually trying to work on that behavior, I don't want to just revert back to the muzzle over or the easy lead over the muzzle. It's more of a Band-Aid, a pulling management system, and we want to make progress in the right direction of constant improvement. Absolutely. The biggest thing is here, folks, uh, if you don't use it, you lose it. And if you aren't actively working toward bettering obedience all the way around, it's going to get sloppy on you. And uh, case in point right here, okay, some of our older dogs we get that are finished, I mean, talking titled master hunters, utility prize dogs, invitational flunkies, the whole nine yards, okay? Um, they he didn't fail his healing portion of the no. invitational, though. But they get lax if you don't work on it. And um, so take the time, work the drills. Even if they seem silly, they make it better for when you need that extra help otherwise. So what's the next one we got here? Jeremy Case <coughs> said, Pup gets the water and is nuts for birds, but won't swim for a frozen bird in the water. Sending a Patreon vid tonight, but others might need advice too. So, question slash clarification for this mm. question. Oh, do you know? Wait, 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 wait. Um, I saw it come through here. I do have electronic launchers. I have remote launchers, and I'm struggling to find trap pigeons slash trap pigeons, okay? So, if you need, need pigeons, if you're struggle bossing it, um, I don't know if you live in town. This is for spurs and fur outdoors. I don't know if you live in town or if you have access to a place out town. I would recommend growing some of your own. It's really, really easy to keep them alive and healthy, and that'll help. But as far as getting extra, if you're struggle busting, and that's anybody here, we can help you out for the most part. If I get another batch of birds in, I'll open back up feral training birds for sale. Um, there's another gentleman out there that is local, and he's checked with me a couple times. We overbought for some folks that came down from Minnesota, and I've cleaned through a majority of those. If I get a call from uh, some of the local guys again here, I'll pick up another batch of birds, and then I'll have more to ship out to you if anybody needs and it. And to be completely honest in the situation... It's a straight-across thing. I'm making zero dollars, okay? Because, But when you divide out the birds, the cost of the birds, and the shipping, they're fairly expensive training birds, they but... Are. Uh, like Ethan said, we're not making money off of the birds. We're just having them available for people that need them because what we're charging you in shipping is what it costs us to ship them to you. Yeah, and then the cost of the birds, the box to ship them in, and the shipping, it all adds up. Zero dollars. It's a straight across just so that you all have access to them when you can't get them. So um, back to this one here. We've got the... Um, Frozen bird. Yep. So a couple of questions for clarification is... So your puppy's getting in the water. They're nuts for birds. I'm assuming that's live birds, but they won't swim for a frozen bird in the water. So are they retrieving bumpers out of the water or only live birds out of the water right now? And what is your reasoning to try and get them to swim for a frozen bird in the water? That's probably what they have access to. I mean... Right, but my question is, do they need the bird to get the puppy to swim if... 99% of the time, we use Water. bumper work, okay? If we don't have a dog that won't, we have a dog that won't retrieve bumpers. Throwing birds, frozen birds, all kinds of things in the water is a total disaster because they get sloppy and gross, and it encourages horrible retrieving habits. The soggier and grosser that bird is, the more the dog's going to either refuse it or just chew on it and mouth it and gnaw it, and it's horrible. So... Um, plastic is a lot better option for a water standpoint. You need to incorporate some bird retrieves, but if you look at any of the retriever work, they're going to use a duck once, they're going to dry that sucker. That's going to help keep it to be able to reuse it a few more times, but once they get saturated, no bueno. Throw some more info in here for us real quick, and we'll... Uh, he wants the bird badly. 
but, but he not won't the swim. frozen bird. But he won't swim for the frozen bird. More clarification. More, he, yeah, pup gets the water. Okay. Uh, John Kennedy, thank you for the super chat. Super chat, just because you guys gave us our pup. Awesome and fun dog. Hands down, best dog I've had. Thanks, Ethan and Kat. Uh, well, thank you. That's really sweet. And we appreciate your support as well on Patreon, John. And good just luck the fact with that Jude at your NA test coming up. Yes, and just appreciate the fact that you've given uh, her an awesome home. That means the world to us. Just trying to get him to swim. So he wants the bird, doesn't want to get in the water to swim. Won't swim, won't swim, right? Or frozen bird. Well, it said gets pup gets the water. Yeah. Okay. That's so why I was confused. Won't swim. He, he wants the bird. Gets in the water, but won't actually swim. Ah! ah. <laughs> At light bulb I wish, moment. I wish there was like an instant replay on that. Ah! It gets would be hilarious. In the water, so, I'm going to see if I can break. pull a screen grab and then make that the thumbnail for this video and just put text in there. Ah! <laughs> That'll get everybody to click on it. So that actually is pretty common where a puppy will get their legs wet, get their feet wet, splash around, but mm -hmm. won't actually break over and swim. And you can see them. They're at that edge. They're at that boundary of, they I won't just break need over. to go, and I really want to, and I'm super excited <laughs> for that <laughs> bird. But they won't actually make that last little leap of faith to get out there, getting in the water with them typically is very helpful because you can stand just on the other side of that breaking point and encourage them to come to you, tease them with that bird, keep was pulling close, their focus out. I was out. this close to that today with Scooby. In. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I we tossed the bumper a little bit too far, and it was like, ah, I did not prepare for water day. I'm wearing jeans and stuff, so I took my wallet out and my cell phone out. And I'm like, trudge, 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 trudge out into the water, and guess what? Scooby swims now. And that just helps them have the confidence to go out in the water themselves. And typically... This is a, this is a valid question. Jeremy, do you know how to swim? <laughs> but most likely, he won't have to swim. Nah, if, just wade. Just, just wade. wade. Um, but also, once those puppies actually learn that, oh, wow, I can swim, and they break over, and they've done it a few times, that's when you can go back to going, I don't need a live bird. I can do this for a bumper, or I can do this for, um, well, a bumper. A bumper. That'd be ideal. <laughs> a bumper. I mean, that's really I ideal situation. I a bumper, situation. and I'm completely comfortable doing this, and I love to retrieve, so I'm going to do it anyway. The other side of it is just incorporating non-retrieving based stuff. Sometimes we'll get in a kayak or paddle around and say, hey, pup, come with me. Just practice swimming, right? So, and but ultimately, a lot of our puppies also have FOMO, so they don't want to get left behind. So they're on the bank, you're in the water, and they see you paddling away from it. them. And they're like, no, wait for me. And they just are like, okay, I can do this now because I don't want to get left behind. And most of our dogs we take to the lake with us, okay? And we get in the water, they get in the water, everybody's in the water together, huzzah. You know, they're left on the boat or they're left on the, the shore and they feel left out because everybody's in the water but them. So they just, mm, screw it, they're in the water. So, yep. Perfect. Next one, what do we got? Sabrina Berry says, I have a nine-week-old pup, and he's not interested in being hand-fed for the beginning clicker training. Tips on keeping him interested and focused. So, um, are they interested in any of the training at all? Or, excuse me, are they interested in any of the clicker training where they're eating from you at all. Like if they're super pumped up and excited and they can't focus and you need to give them a little bit of a meal to begin with. And then once they've kind of settled down, they can focus on training or is it something that, um, they're not interested in paying attention. You're going to make me pour another drink, aren't you? Oh gosh, this is going to get good. Um, or are they not interested in, any food, any training the entire time. Um, nine weeks old, you know, sometimes it takes puppies a little bit of time to get comfortable. Sorry, looking at you talking out of the microphone. Um, sometimes it takes puppies a little time to get comfortable eating out of your hand. Um, some puppies don't know how to do it. I know it sounds kind of silly, but they're like, 
where, where's the food? I can't see it. I don't know how to eat it. Um, same will happen if you drop kibble on the ground. It's like once it hits the floor, it disappears sometimes. And they're like, okay, where's the food? Um, so getting a little more information again. Did she mention anything else? I don't see it there. I mean, for, for me, what it sounds like, it's just, I, I move right to the tough love aspect of it. It says not interested or keeping focus. It's just, if you stay focused for the meal, great. If not, then not. But if the puppy is eating and almost frantic and can't focus, like Kat was saying, are you not able to find what's going on? But if the pup just loses interest altogether, we need to build a little more. Drive and desire. Yeah. And to do that, we would say, okay, tough love. breakfast is over. Yeah, you chose Puppies. not to eat. Puppy's going to be hungrier for dinner and hopefully give us a little more focus. Yes. If they're not hungry for dinner, breakfast again tomorrow. Um, we are the Tough Love crew, and we do it with our son, too. Bil- yeah. Yes, we do. Building um, building character, one skipped meal at a time. Okay? Um, having, in, having quality eaters is an important part of any bird dog, any dog that travels or moves around or does anything. They're going to be in new environments. They're going to be in new situations. They're going to be stressed from hunting. They're going to be tired from hunting. They need to be good eaters. That is a extremely important part, and that starts in this puppy stage. So if you don't develop good eaters now, you're going to fight it the entire time you own the dog. All right, we've got an... Okay, so just, Sabrina just mentioned. Oh, okay. Um, he just doesn't seem interested in the food in general. He Aha. walks away and Skip would rather play with meal. my older dogs. As well Done. as if the distraction of your older dogs is there, maybe just put Eliminate your older dogs up for that training session, put them in a back bedroom, crate them, whatever, for the length of the training session so that you can try and eliminate any of the distractions so that you can keep your puppies focused. You see this firsthand in almost every single video that I do. It's like I've always got some level of distraction for that puppy. And when we do that, it's like, Okay, we need to eliminate this distraction. Oh, now we've got a new distraction. We need to eliminate that distraction. So start eliminating distractions. And then if the puppy still is not interested, you say, Tough meal's love. done. That meal doesn't come back. You don't get double feeding for dinner. You get the one opportunity for your half of uh, the daily ration, if you will, in the evening. And it's only going to take two or three meals before they're like, dang, I'm hungry. And then you have focus. You have. And we have then developed a good work ethic because our puppies then learn to work for their meals. Correct. Um, and we've created food motivation, which is super important for the rest of their training. So um, I was wondering the, if yeah, tough love have was the answer. hundred percent the answer. It's uh, the go-to. Now in the, the history of this last, you just heard how long we've been in dogs. It's been about 12 or 13 years in business, nine ish as of yesterday. Um, I've only seen a handful of dogs that didn't eat well, and I owned two of them, okay? We tried all the things. So if you end up with a dog that just really doesn't eat well, but that wasn't as a puppy. That was kind of like a learned behavior as Mm -hmm. they got older. They just got, meh, self-regulators, and those are usually dogs that are easy keepers, and they fall into that category of they only eat when they're hungry, and they don't get hungry as often. And they typically have a much more laid-back personality in Uh general. Yep. Vino was one of them. We spent a bunch of money figuring out why she didn't want to eat. To find out she just wasn't hungry. (laughs) Didn't want to eat. So um, we've got Tanner. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you for the $24.99 super chat. Um, I don't see a question in here. If you have one, buddy. uh, Oh, here it comes down. There it is. Yep. I did the super chat wrong. No, you did it perfect. It happens. And sometimes it happens because it seems like you put in a question that's too long and then it doesn't let it stay there. I've heard that that happens. So. I do have a question, kind of. Okay. So my dog will play fetch, ball, frisbee, etc., retrieve and training bumpers, etc. He will fetch it, hold it till commanded, release to hand. Need the rest of it. Frozen now. birds, too, oh. but when hunting, most of the time, we'll only bring back halfway, and they go back to point another. Aha. Aha. Mm-hmm. So this is actually not also too uncommon. Um, a lot of dogs are very excited about the entire process of hunting. They're pumped up in the field and they're ready to find the next bird. So they get sloppy with their retrieving as well as when you're out in the field hunting and there's all that excitement going on. Um, 
things are a little more fast paced as well as people don't typically slow down and try and work through those training situations or you're also opportunities. Excited. Yep. And you're like, ah, that's good enough. Let's go find the next bird. And then it just becomes a conditioned habit of, well, that's how I retrieve in the field with birds because that's what dad expects. And that's all he ever asks me to do. Well, and dogs are, are placed and situationally oriented. Mm-hmm. So you go back and forth and they know in the yard it's structure and in the field it's all bets are off. Yes. So typically if you haven't done a trained retrieve already, which I know it says that he'll hold till commanded to release to hand, um, but a lot of dogs will do that naturally through some hold conditioning, through some positive reinforcement, and sometimes those dogs need the complete conditioning process. Just like a puppy that is super cooperative in low distraction situations will recall for Doing a treat. Again, guys. Good day will recall for a treat for you really well, but then when they're distracted or there's something else that they'd rather be doing, they're like, eh, I'm not going to really come back this time. And that's where we call or condition them to recall. The same can happen for the retrieving, that in those situations where it's low distraction and very controlled and you've kind of done some of that hold conditioning through positive reinforcement, then they're like, yeah, I can do it now. But in those exciting dis- distracting situations like hunting, they're like, not going to do it. And you have no way to truly reinforce that situation. So formal retriever. Have another one. Okay. Is this thing on? Hey, Um, formal retrieving work is going to take a good retriever and make them basically perfect. And it's going to take a poor retriever and make them pretty good to above average. So um, and, and it sounds like your dog is a pretty good retriever yeah, to begin You're with. You're already there. We just so need to polish a few things. Shine that baby. And See we've had reflection. a lot of Patreon clients, customers, members, That's a big patrons. one. I mean, it's probably the biggest learning curve of any of the training. It's the least straightforward because every single dog goes through differently. So, But a lot of patrons utilize Patreon for help with the formal retrieving work because it does have the big learning curve. And also, a lot of times, people lack the confidence of, when to move to the next step, when Correct. to push, when to just say this was a good enough session and we're done for the day, and it allows us to help guide you a little bit. There's one gentleman that just finished up. He just finished his full um, formal retrieving process with his lab, and he said, uh, if anybody ever wants to know if the live tier is worth it uh, for this specific training, especially 100% was that's how he said, it's the only way I was able to work through it, having you right there watching my sessions, helping me through each step of the way. So, And um, his dog is doing phenomenal now. You're talking about Scott. Yes, and yep. Scott said he'd be happy to talk to anybody that is questioning whether or not it's worth it. So um, next one we've got here says, what is a good way to find a reputable breeder? Can you give a simple timeline on the first year of training? Okay, so... First things first, we have done videos on both of these, but I will give you the cliff notes, okay? Um, How to find a reputable breeder. Uh, There's a lot of different things that go into this. A few of them are going to be, and I'm going to step on several people's toes when I say this, but... Ooh, another brutally honest comment from Ethan. Yeah, but I kind of pussyfooted around the brutally honest part because we're friends with a lot of breeders and other people in the dog world, and I really don't want to offend people. And it's a small world, truly it is. small. Especially within our niche of breeding short hairs. Yes. So um, first thing that I kind of look at as a big red flag is if they have listed out, we breed labs and short hairs and Britneys and setters and... Multiple breeds. My personal opinion, okay? And as... Uh, Especially multiple breeds that aren't within the same say. genre. So not two pointing breeds, not two retrieving breeds. Those are really big red flags because those are two completely opposite testing and training goals. And it's hard to do justice to That's both the breeds. ticket, okay? So we put an insane amount of time, effort, and energy, blood, sweat, and tears into our breeding program, okay? Uh, we make the hard decisions. We pick the best dogs that we can. We we test them to the max, which involves hunting and training and advanced testing and titling, all of the things to say, yes, you make the cut. 
And no, you do not make the cut. And some of those decisions are extremely hard, okay? Um, but we do that. And thinking about trying to start that with another breed is overwhelming for me because I don't believe that I could truly do justice to both. Yes, we could make puppies. It's a huge time commitment. But I sure. don't believe we could do justice to both. So um, that would be the big thing. The next is then to go see the dogs, talk to the person, find out, do they have the same goals with their program as you are looking for out of your dog? That's the next thing. The last is going to be a guarantee aspect of things. Do they stand behind their dogs? Do they care what you do with them? Do they care where they go, what they're doing, all of the things? So, Do they want to keep in contact with their puppy buyers after the fact to help with questions or issues that you might have or just to hear how your dog is doing down the road? Talking to your breeder should feel a little more like you're being interviewed versus the other way around. And if that's the kind of feeling you get, like they're truly vetting to see, do you seem like a good fit for our dogs? That means they care, okay? That may, that goes a long way. And then the last thing would be finding out what age they send their puppies home. Because uh, puppies in 48 of the 50 states, there is actually a law that... Is it 48? I'm pretty sure. We, did a, a, we did a video on this as well. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of the states, though, have a state requirement or law saying that puppies Just have Google to go home at... Eight weeks old. Seven to eight. Yeah, those are the two numbers. And there's a lot of people that reach out to us. I got my puppy at six weeks old. Well, that's wah, way wah, too wah. young. Um, because your puppy's not ready to leave their litter mates um, by then. They've maybe been weaned for a week if they're on our, you know, breeding and weaning timeline, as well as they typically have, you know, less developed bladders by that point. They also... Um, are just, like I said, figuring out that eating on their own. So they're not going to be ready to really start any formal training, clicker training yet. Um, they're going to struggle to be crate trained, all the things that they really need to still be with their litter mates for further socialization. Um, so they should go home at eight weeks old. This is perfect. Now, the next part of this is, is can you give a simple timeline? So two things, and we've been working on this for a while. So I apologize Life happens. We've got a lot of things rolling, and um, the dogs take precedence, okay? So when we've got dogs here, our time goes into them, and then we try and spend some family time, and usually we run out of time for the extra things. There's like only so many hours in the day. Let's create a new business. Okay, so um, the timeline. We're trying to create a step-by-step -step follow the online training course thing, and it is in the works, but it's going to take time. And I apologize for all of y'all that have puppies now that are like, oh, I would love to utilize that. But what we would recommend that you do is go to our um, YouTube channel, Standing Stone Kennels. You go to YouTube, search Standing Stone Kennels, and then click the subscribe button if you haven't already. And then after that, um, click on playlists. Can you see that? Yeah, kind of. You got to cock it just a little more like that. Anyhow, when you get to the playlist section, um, that's going to be the real money maker. You roll through those and you find Quest or Thunder or Fox or Rogue, Rogue or Sprig, Sprig or Clutch, Clutch or, or Mac. Mac or Fox. I said Fox, but we've got a Fine. literal crap ton of videos out there and when you hit those playlists they're in order step by step from uh puppy through a year okay approximately a year like puppy training with sprig yep you can just that zip, first zip, video zip. Oh, right there that's the first video that's the second video that's the third video that's the that's order the in which we taught him all of the things okay so definitely hit those playlists up that's going to be the best thing that we have right now and then hit us up on patreon that's where we can help guide you the rest of the way great 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 question anna h says two-year-old visha working on whoa he does great while on a lead and a belly collar but when we're in the field i would i say well he runs back to me okay so are you still wearing that belly collar in the field or do you feel like you were collar conditioned on the neck, this is going to be a big thing. Um, if you are having a dog that is running back to you, when you say, whoa, 
then they don't understand. That's the long and short of it. If they're doing well with the belly collar in the yard, but then struggle in the field and are having trouble with that transition, we would utilize the belly collar in the field. That is a simple solution where you can kind of, uh, a lot of times dog training is just about breaking the sequence, okay? Stopping the the pattern that is that is reoccurring. What are we seeing? She's stopping or she's coming to me in the field when I say, whoa. So in the field is where we need to work these things. So utilize what worked in the yard, just apply it in the field. Now, if you go and you're still struggling with these things in the yard, even um, this is where a whoa post, something that we don't often use. It's kind of one of those tricks in the, in the old bag that we pull out on occasion. We have a dog that has a strong has to come to you thing and the belly collar is not working or anything else. We will tether them to the whoa post and that really helps them to understand, hey, that collar means stop, not come and to me. And stop at a distance because a lot of times what will happen is the dogs will come all the way towards you and then stop, and then you can create some distance between you and the dog again, but... You need them to stop. We need this stop at there. a distance. Yep. yep. So I hope that makes sense. If you have, if I was confused a little bit, Anna or... Yeah, Anna, Anna H. Yeah, Anna, just throw... Sorry, I'm blind. Um, and just we, throw it in there. And we just did put out a video with Thunder and the five slash six steps to woe training. Yeah, um, step by step. So I don't know if you've seen that, but it breaks down all those steps pretty clearly. Um, and maybe you missed a step that could be revisited or just going through that process again to make sure that there is a full understanding of the belly collar and then the transition back to the neck collar. Absolutely. All right, we've got Sabrina Barry. It says, do you add any supplements, toppers, et cetera, to your dog's kibble? How long do you keep puppies on puppy kibble? Thanks again. All right, as far as supplements go, on average, no. And we've done a handful of different things, and there is a variety of some studies. You know, an increased amount of fat is going to be good for any dogs as, well, as long as that fat is good. Um, but... Since switching to Yukonuba dog food, we've pretty much quit any of the toppers, if you will. Um, and we've been able to make adjustments to what each individual dog needs where we couldn't do before by switching their formulas. Okay, so the, um, the three that we utilize, they have a, it's called sprint, I think, and then exercise, sport, and work. Um, the 2616 is what we use the sprint. We don't utilize. It's actually formulated more for short distance bursts, things like agility or dock, they even diving, list dock diving. Yes. So short bursts of energy. All of our dogs are more on a continued steady state type of active thing. And so 2616, 3020, or 3028 are the three formulas. Now, the 3028, as far as I know, is not readily available to the public. Um, the 2616 and the 3020, we go back and forth between those. Our easy keepers in the off-season eat that, the, the, the 2616. The 3020, that's going to be your higher energy or during the hunting season for a majority of dogs. Now, how long do we keep the puppies on puppy kibble? That depends on the dog. Most of them, we try and keep it on them as long as possible. Once we start increased activity and we struggle to hold weight on a reasonable amount of food, which is going to be less than four cups. So yep. four cups, two cups, cups the in the morning, two cups in the evening, because we feed twice a day. If we're feeding that four cups and they won't hold weight, we're ready to go up to 30, 20. Yep. And... Typically, on average, that is a little less than a year old, yeah. probably in that nine-month mark. Um, Trix is seven months old. She's still on puppy food. So, um, Yep. And it also, like Ethan said, depends on the dog. Some dogs have higher metabolisms than others, um, so they might need to start at seven months, whereas some dogs are a little bit lower key and slower metazel metabolism and we can get them to a year so it just depends they say you can feed that puppy food upwards of two years i believe yes but is it? 
Yes. But uh, most of our dogs, it's 12 months or a little under is when we're switching them. Because they just can't hold weight on that reasonable amount of food with the level of activity and training that we would do with them. So, Well, a large breed puppy food to anybody that has a bigger dog, why large breed versus regular puppy food? The large breed is actually a calorie deprivation. It's designed to prevent big dogs from growing too fast. So once they reach an activity level that outgrows the calories, we kind of have to just switch from a calorie intake and outtake aspect of things um, to that higher fat and protein content. Yeah, because we definitely don't want them getting fat and growing too fast. That's perfect. Guys, That's thank it. you. That was a really fun long yawa. I like the new format. Let us know if you like the new format of having a topic, going through some announcements, Ethan's brutally honest comments, and then opening up to super chats. So... I'll try and be as brutally honest as I and, and have another I believe bourbon. we are done for the evening. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching. I'm Cat the Dog Trainer. He's the guy with the bourbon. I'm the guy with the pink gun, and I'm out of bourbon. So we're out of time. <laughs> we'll see you guys next week. Goodbye. <laughs>